Chapter 281. The Wedding Eye. Translator. Endless Fantasy Translation Editor. Endless Fantasy Translation. Abel, one of the four great knights of Bysir City, waved around his horsewhip around and took a glance at Grimm, the new knight who had caught people's eyes in the last three months. Seeing him getting all the attention of Bysir City, he couldn't help but feel surprised. Although he had never sparred with Grimm before, Abel could feel a threatening presence from this new knight, he was literally a fearsome beast. Could it be that, he was one of the legendary knights? Abel and the other three great knights had tried to guess Grimm's identity for quite some time, going as far as assuming that he was a legendary knight. Yet, they always ended up with the same conclusion, no, he couldn't be one. Even though he was immensely powerful, Grimm did not have the power to release the wrath of blood force. Thud thud thud. Two hundred knights, under the order of Lefay, the governor of Bysir City, were surrounding a group of bandits that were causing trouble in between two cities near Bysir City. In the public's eyes, Lefay was a sorcerer apprentice that had recently returned from the Great Sorcerer Academy and now she was attempting to restore order amongst the nobles. In the public's eyes, she was a wise ruler. However, these were just the tasks that she was forced to undertake under the influence of a black sorcerer. In the shadows, her main objective was to collect human despair for his experiments. The bandits that reside in between the cities and in the eastern coral island were all extremely afraid of a certain legend in regards to Bysir City. In recent years, the number of bandits had decreased dramatically while merchants flocked in, flourishing the economy. Thus, indirectly Lefay had improved the lives of the people of Eastern Coral Island earning her tremendous respect amongst the citizens. Tiger Wolf Mountain This was a mountain that was covered by a thick forest and had roads that merchants often used to commute between cities. Thus, there was a gang of bandits settled down in these woods calling themselves the Nine Wolf Gang. There were about 200 bandits in their ranks. Bysir City had sent out about the same number of knights to deal with them. Their main objective was to take out the leader of Nine Wolf Gang. Clad in a full suit of armor and wearing a metal helm, Grim rode on a white horse with a long sword held in his hand. With his golden hair and white cape swinging against the wind, he looked like a handsome knight from the fairy tales. There were other men tagging along, wielding swords and axes. Some of them secretly took a peek at Grimm, and thought to themselves. What kind of great feats he would achieve this time? Could he rise up to become the fifth knight commander of Bysir in one go? Knights, clad in shining armors, lined up orderly as they leered at the bandits that were carrying their bows and axes. Abel and the other three knight commanders stepped out from their formation. Listen up, bandits. Put down your weapons and surrender at once. You will be brought back to Bysir City and accept judgment from the great Governor Lefay. Sitha, one of the knight commanders, loudly yelled. On the mountain, the leader of the bandits laughed coldly. He he, the other bandits might be afraid of Bysir City but we are the Nine Wolf Gang. I'll see if you cucks dare to come up and fight us. Governor of Bysir City? She's just an innocent-looking slut. Ha ha ha. As he laughed loudly, the bandit leader retreated back into his hiding and looked anxiously to a man next to him. Bald, muscular, scars, and one of his ears was missing. Left ear bare, you're up. Patting on the man's shoulder, the bandit leader ordered with a smile. Carrying a massive hammer on his shoulder, Left Ear Bear replied coldly, HMPH, it's just one sorcerer apprentice. She can't possibly think that she owns the entire eastern coral island as her turf, can she? Pausing momentarily, he continued on, I have contacted a great sorcerer using a method that was passed down from my ancestors. He will come and sign a contract with me soon. So long as I can sign the contract and receive bloodline modification, I will then be able to fly across the sea or dive into the grounds in search of the void world. By then, this so-called sorcerer apprentice. 
As he was talking, left ear bear's skin had started to form a layer of blood aura, as though the blood of his entire body had started to ignite into flames. It's the blood force, the power that legendary knights possessed, this was also the power that sorcerer bestowed onto the knights via bloodline modification. As both of them were chatting, a loud bellow could be heard from below the mountains. Charge! Then, fierce horse thuds, roars of soldiers could be nearing their location. HMPH. So be it. Left ear bear beamed as he dashed toward the Bysir city's knights. He quickly laid his eyes on the white horse riding knight and decided that this would be his first kill. Boom. 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 Die. Left ear bear lifted his massive hammer while his body burned with blood aura and took a few heavy steps which made the ground tremble, and then leapt into the sky. In a few seconds, the massive hammer crashed down to the ground like a meteor. From afar, it felt as though a giant had come crashing down, intending to tear everything in front of him asunder. Ha ha! Yes! Explode them into fireworks of blood! The bandit leader was shouting excitedly. In this two years, since Left Ear Bear ranked up to be a legendary knight, with his immense strength and the power of blood force, there was rarely anyone who would resist their extortion. And the ones who did had all been turned into piles of flesh by this massive hammer. Thus, the bandits had secretly given Left Ear Bear a nickname, the Tyrant Bear. The bandits and their leader were excited as they saw the hammer falling rapidly at the night. They cheered and cheered, letting their excitement overwhelm them. This was how it went in the last two years. Every time the tyrant bear landed his strike, the others would immediately lose all their will to resist. And then, the other bandits would march forward to kill them. The hammer attack also had a few nicknames. It was sometime called the Big Sauce Bang, Fireworks of Blood. They had all widened their eyes to watch this magnificent view. To them, that gory moment when the hammer landed on its target was the work of art. On the other hand, the knights were shocked. Blood force. Legendary knight. How could this be? A legendary knight hidden amongst a gang of bandits? The four knight commander's faces had turned pale after seeing this. Although it was difficult for a legendary knight to take on the force of two hundred men, he had the other two hundred men from the Nine Wolf Gang to fight with him. Besides, if the legendary knight had locked onto any one of them, it was a sure bet that that one person would be dead in mere minutes. It was absolutely horrifying. With this legendary knight in their ranks, even if they were able to win this battle, it would be unavoidable for them to suffer great casualties. The only thing that the four knight commanders felt relieved is that the legendary knight had not set his eyes on them. Instead, it was Grimm, the new knight who joined three months ago who was being targeted. This knight had been meeting with the great governor Lafay quite a few times and had achieved great feats. If this kept up, he would definitely rock the reputation and status of the four commanders and become the fifth commander of Bysir City. He he, perhaps it was a good thing for this legendary knight to appear after all. The four knight commanders were thinking the same thing. Riding on his white horse, Grimm was in awe as he saw that muscular man wielding a massive hammer crashing towards him. After the death of his soul slave Nor, Grimm had once thought of making a contract with a legendary knight. This would then ensure that his castle would be taken care of and he could save some sorcerer essences along the way. In the eyes of the other knights, they thought Grimm's or was him being petrified by the legendary knight's attack. Seeing this, Countless knights were remorseful. And this also had strengthened their will to defeat the bandits. Cling. A loud metallic noise could be heard. Mere moments before the hammer landed, Grimm pulled out his sword, as always, and lightly swept it in the air. Boom. A dart of a mirror image crashed onto a cliff. It was left ear bear that was hurled straight into the cliff. Im, possible. Spewing out blood and pieces of organs from his mouth, Left Ear Bear uttered his last word before drawing his last breath. 
Still riding his white horse, a few swift slashes had been struck from Grimm's sword. What? What? The four knight commanders of Bysir City were shocked as they witnessed this impossibly powerful knight. He was like a hero straight out from a fairy tale. They couldn't believe their eyes. Grimm threw a cold gaze at the legendary knight. This thing had only about thirty constitution. He was weaker than any sorcerer apprentice. No, he was even weaker than a level one creature. However, Grimm took great care to envelop his horse with force fields, he did not want to ruin his good image. Le Fay's dream wedding, it was to have the strongest, perfect knight to appear in front of the public and ask for her hand in marriage. This was always Le Fay's dream since her childhood. A fairy tale like wedding. Grimm wanted to do his best to make that happen, to become the strongest, perfect knight. He had spent three whopping months to refine his image and became the great knight of justice in Bysir City. Grimm knew that as a sorcerer, it was such a childish act to do this. However, it was also an interesting experience for him. It was not only to fulfill the dream of the love of his life but also to make one of his childhood dreams come true. Three days later, the citizens of Bysir City were cheering excitedly as Grimm led the other four knight commanders up to the castle, dragging the chained nine wolf bandits. Looking on from her castle balcony, Le Fay waved her hands to calm her subjects. Then, facing Grimm, who was holding the head of Left Ear Bear, Le Fay flashed a beautiful smile and asked in front of countless Bysir citizens, O oh Grimm, my brave knight. What price should I grant you? Kneeling on the ground, Grimm looked Le Fay in the eyes and replied loudly, O oh great Governor Le Fay, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. You are the goddess of perfection. And I fell deeply in love with you. I am willing to spend my entire life to be by your side to protect you. Please, would you accept my vow to love you for eternity? A long silence befell by Seer City. The citizens couldn't believe what they had heard. Was this a proposal? A marriage proposal to their great governor Le Fay? Chapter 282, The Wedding 2 Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation The joy of celebration could be felt in the air of Bysir City. Every citizen had delighted looks on their faces. Three days ago, their great governor Le Fay had agreed to Grimm's marriage proposal and they had announced that their wedding would be held in a week's time. The entire city was filled with bliss after receiving such great news. After taking some time to sink in what they've heard, the citizens had gotten busy in preparation for the big day. They wanted to do their part to help Le Fay, the great governor who had been wisely ruling the city since their great-great-grandparents' time, to organize the most beautiful wedding in the city. To the ignorant public, they knew very little about knights and sorcerer apprentices. To them, they were legends. Knights were brave, loyal and fearless, while sorcerers were mysterious, erudite, and wise. Thus, in the eyes of the Bysir citizens, the marriage between Grimm and Le Fay was a perfect marriage of the two sets of values. As for the strength and power of knights and sorcerers, these weren't something that the eastern coral islanders knew at all. However, the atmosphere at the Crescent Bar was a little different. Wiping off the liquor on his mouth, Abel hit the table fiercely and mumbled in a sore sobbing tone, Oh, the perfect Le Fay. Why did she agree to the marriage proposal of a greenhorn? Why? Sitha, also drunk, patted Abel's back, trying to comfort him. Abel, could you ask around in the city? Just how many unmarried men idolize our wonderful governor? Ha ha ha. Ugh. After letting a drunken burp, Sithus continued on, however, you have got to get this clear. Le Fay was already a perfect woman since we're just children. She is our governor first, and a powerful sorceress, then a woman. Gaia, the muscular-looking knight commander, gulped down a full mug of liquor then poured another for Abel. Abel, can't you see? I might look stupid, but I know this more than any of you. 
You've no idea just how powerful legendary knights are. And still, Grim could deal with one with a single slash. Three months. He appeared for merely three months and he had already asked our governor for her hand in marriage. And she said yes. Shaking his head, Gaia continued gulping down liquor from his mug. Stunned after hearing Gaia's words, Abel looked at Gaia in surprise. Do you mean? He he, I think this groom is a sorcerer. Or at least, a greater legendary knight who underwent higher bloodline modification, Gaia replied. Abel, come. Drink. And it's about time for you to find yourself a wife and have her to teach you how to be a man. The grey-haired Yuno offered Abel another mug of liquor. Eastern Coral Island, a coast that rarely had visitors. Tidal waves crashed on a huge rock a hundred-meter rock standing on the coastline, tanking thousands of years of tidal waves. The sun was setting as the evening winds blew. From afar, crabs and shells were lifted up by the tidal waves and sent onto the beach. It was beautiful. On the huge rock, Le Fay was resting in Grimm's arms, closing her eyes as she enjoyed the warm evening winds blowing her frail body and listening to Grimm's heartbeat. Le Fay. Grimm called out softly to her. Raising her starry eyes, Le Fay looked at Grimm and replied with a sweet voice, Yes. I love you. Grimm looked into Le Fay's eyes, as though he was trying to keep her in his memory forever. Overwhelmed by happiness, Le Fay closed her eyes and rest back into Grimm's arms like a kitten. A smile could be seen on her face. I love you too. A few seagulls flew past them, gawking at the two humans. Not daring to disturb them, the seagulls circled in the sky for a moment before flying away. Sunset, seagulls, tidal waves on the coastline, and two of them cuddling. How romantic. Looking at Le Fay who was enjoying this moment of peace and quiet happily, Grim too beamed in delight. Yet, his eyes were filled with sadness. So, this was how it felt like to fall in love with a low-level creature. Le Fay's lifespan as a sorcerer apprentice was nearing its end. She had at most, a dozen years left to live, her soul was aging rapidly and had started to disintegrate. A few dozen years was just a short moment to Grimm. Yet, it was enough for Le Fay to enjoy her final days. However, Grimm would then have to continue living on for thousands of years. How would he be able to endure this? Thus, to Grimm, this short moment of bliss was an unbearable sting of sadness that he had to bear in his long weary life. The more he fell in love, the harder the fall. This was, perhaps, the reason why many sorcerers did not choose to marry one another and tried to produce offsprings. However, Grimm did not feel any regret at all. It did not matter how long he got to live. It did not matter at all, for those sweet innocent memories and love would never happen again. Everyone was growing up. As they matured, they put on a cold mask to shield their real selves. It was like forming up a sturdy cocoon to shield up their most innocent self and memories. It was a ruthless way to mature. It's impossible to go back to those youthful days, the days when they had dreams and fantasies. The days when they were so sure that they could one day master everything in the world and make everything better. Such endless sadness. Now all that Grimm could do was to give it his all to treasure the moments he had left with the love of his life, pouring all of his love and affection into a kiss onto her forehead. Time was still flowing by, it waited no one, and would not stop just because one person wished so. Tiger Wolf Mountain after the fierce attack by the Bysir City's knights, there were only one bandit leader and several dozens of wounded bandits left. The once powerful bandit group, one that ruled the Tiger Wolf Mountain, was now a weakened group of losers. Looking at the now empty treasure vault after being ransacked by the Bysir knights, Waltster couldn't help but feel great despair. Arg! Bellowing loudly, Waltzer cover his eyes with the only arm he's got left as tears ran down his cheeks. The other bandits too couldn't help but begin tearing up. Nine Wolf Gang, 
was no more. To the eastern coral islanders, the Nine Wolf Gang was sinful, evil, and filthy. However, to these bandits, Nine Wolf Gang was their home. Suddenly, several bandits rushed into the secret chamber and stuttered, Sorcerer, Sorcerer. Hem. Before Waltster was able to react, a terrifying person appeared in the chamber right out of thin air. He was wearing a hat, embedded with a pair of deer antlers. His eyes looked like they belonged to a cat. Wearing large sorcerer robes, he hovered in the air as grey elements floated around him. The descendant of woodwork cats. Where is he? The sorcerer's voice echoed in the chamber. Sorcerer. Woodwork cats. Waltster quickly recalled Left Ear Bear. So, this great sorcerer was the one Left Ear Bear mentioned before. The great sorcerer who was going to form a pact with him. Overwhelmed by hatred, Waltster kneeled on the floor and wept. O oh, great sorcerer, a few days ago the governor of Bysir City Le Fay, a sorcerer apprentice from the Great Sorcerer Academy had attacked us in the name of unifying the Eastern Coral Island. She wanted Garland, who had recently ranked up to be a legendary knight, to surrender to her. He told her that he had decided to form a pact with another great sorcerer, this enraged the evil Le Fay Anne, and she had slain him. Chapter 283 The Wedding 3 Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation Nina York watched Grimm stumble in his elegant suit with a wry smile. She was attending his wedding as his grandmother. Grimm, no. You're doing it wrong. Those three buttons are all done wrong. Besides, you should have the black sleeves worn inside. And that rose on the left side of your chest. It must have twelve petals. Oh, look at your collar, and this too. Nina York pointed at Grimm's suit and taught him how to deal with the various mannerisms one by one. Phew. Massaging his brow, Grimm appeared to have gotten weary from all this. The suits that the nobles wear during weddings were so complicated. No wonder the sorcerers prefer to just wear a huge robe instead of these gowns of nightmares. What a waste of time. However, it couldn't be helped. Perhaps this was also how these lavish living folk displayed how different they were from the peasants. Ignorant. Letting out a sigh, Grimm fixed his suits following Nina York's advice. Nina York, could you please recite again the order of the wedding protocols for me? I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Sitting on a sofa, Nina York's eyes were filled with sweet joyful bliss. This reminded her of her own wedding in the distant past. Like Grimm, Nina York had chosen love and married her sorcerer apprentice. She had lived a period of lovely, sweet life. It was after a long time that she had decided to pursue more strength in sorcery, and grew distant from her husband, becoming less and less concerned with her appearance. Looking at Grimm now, he was finally a full-fledged sorcerer and yet still feeling anxious before his own wedding. How amusing. Two hourglasses later. The streets of Bysir Street was all but cleaned and decorated. The citizens were joyous as they carried bouquets of flowers, waiting excitedly. Today was a day of celebration for Bysir City. Wine and food were served everywhere. On the main street, a thousand-meter-long red carpet was decorated with rose petals, a lovely melody could be heard sounding in the air as the cheering citizens stood at the sides of the street. On the buildings, there were also countless people excitedly flinging rose petals from the second and third stories. Oh, I want to have a wedding like Lord Le Fay one day. A young girl mumbled as she was held by her father. Oh, how beautiful, several children squeezed their heads from the crowd to gaze at the bride. Oh great Governor Lafey and Nightgrim, we wish you a happy and joyous marriage. Youngsters were cheering excitedly. Oh, Lord Lafey she's finally a lovely bride. There was a pair of young boy and girl, carrying a bouquet of flowers, at the front of the wedding convoy, confused and uneasy as they looked at the people congregating on the streets. Still, 
they appeared to be happy as they hopped forward along the red carpet, perhaps being affected by the joyous atmosphere of the entire city. They didn't understand what a wedding or marriage was. Their little minds were pure as crystals and hadn't gotten through any harsh maturing. How pure! How joyful! Grim had a golden crown on his head, with his golden hair gracefully combed under it. His elegant suit was perfect and neat, his shoes were the classy ones that the nobles styled on. Holding Le Fay's hand, Grim waved at the citizens who were gathering on two sides of the streets with his other hand. This was like a scene straight out from a fairy tale. Wearing a snowy tight-waist wedding gown, Le Fay's long black silky hair was swaying against the winds behind her back, the magic necklace that Grim gifted her during the gory test was hanging on her neck, with its pendant sinking in between her huge shapely breast. Walking elegantly with her voluptuous body, Le Fay had her innocent-looking face lowered all the way. Her face was drenched by tears of joy. She covered her face with one of her hand while the other being held by Grimm, wishing that they'll never be separated again. Two hundred years of separation had made this all felt like a beautiful dream. She had waited two hundred years for this moment. She felt that this sheer joy and happiness was crushing her heart. Knights of Bysir City, wearing elegant suits, were quietly tailing Grimm and Le Fay towards the sacred wedding shrine. Grimm felt as though his heart was melting from all this bliss and fused together with Le Fay. Happiness and happiness. That was all that he could feel as he held her hand as he stepped towards the wedding shrine. As a sorcerer, Grimm possessed the ability to control the soul slaves. He could make a person succumb totally to his will. Yet now, he had surrendered himself to love. He would sacrifice himself for his lover. He would do anything for her. After today, Le Fay would be Grimm's wife. She would be his. Accompanied by the cheers of the citizens and flying rose petals, they had finally stepped into the wedding shrine, the place where Grimm and Le Fay would receive the blessings from their friends and relatives. Abel kissed Le Fay's hand as he presented a box to her with a smile. It was a cat's eye jewel inside the box. Dear Lord Lafey, I wish you to be happy always. Abel gave his wishes as he felt a sting in his heart. Receiving the box with a smile, Le Fay beamed at him. Thank you, Abel. Thank you for your loyalty to me and Bysir City. You and your knights have done so much to protect us. Please do continue on with your duty with vigilance. And I wish you finding yourself the love of your life too. Nina York, Grimm's grandmother, gave Grimm her blessings and kissed his cheek. Grimm, that little fella there seems to adore Le Fay a lot. Aren't you jealous? Nina York teasingly whispered in Grimm's ear. Grimm let out a smile. He had spent three months working together with Abel. Grimm could see that he was a gifted, idealistic knight. And there were plenty of ladies in Bysir City that yearned for his affection. He is like a dream of mine when I was younger, Grimm replied. Nina York let out a grin and let Grimm go. And then, she held a box and opened it, a shining stupendous magic jewel was sitting firmly inside the box. Several guests in the shrine let out gasps of surprise when they saw the stone and started to speculate the origin of the jewel. They were also surprised to find out that Grimm might have come from an unusually noble family. With a smile, Grimm received the box from Nina York. The stupendous magic jewel was of great value to any ordinary sorcerer. Unskilled sorcerers would spend over decades to acquire just one of these. To a demon hunter like Grimm these magic jewels were not all that useful though. After spending half an hourglass time, Grimm and Le Fay, having received blessings from countless nobles, turned to each other. Grimm gazed at Le Fay and gasped softly. Le Fay, you're so beautiful. Le Fay raised her hand to her mouth as she smiled. Trying to control her overflowing emotions, she raised her starry eyes to observe Grimm. Then, trying really hard not to burst in laughter, Le Fay replied, Oh my night Grimm, my beauty is well known amongst all citizens of Bysir City. 
Yet, perhaps you didn't know that you are quite handsome yourself. When Grimm was about to burst out in laughter, Le Fay forcefully pressed her lips against his. Wow. Everyone in the shrine cheered while pointing teasingly at the newlyweds. A full minute later, Grimm and Le Fay finally separate from their kiss, gazing blissfully as they gasped for air. Slowly, Le Fay took out a blackened metal and presented it to Grimm with a smile, My night Grimm, my great-great-grandfather left this with me. He said if there's anyone who could uncover its mystery, that person would one day become a great powerful sorcerer. I want you to have it. Several nobles were laughing teasingly. They thought it was a prank that Le Fay was playing with her husband, no one would present a rusted beaten metal as their wedding gift, would they? Some of them even thought that, perhaps this meant that Le Fay was trying to imply that her marriage to Grimm was not out of true love, so Grimm was just a beaten rusted metal in Le Fay's eyes. Nina York didn't understand too. However, she did not put too much thought into this. However, Grimm's pupils shrank the moment he saw this metal. This metal, it was like the same one that Grimm had acquired from the Pyrodust world, that mysterious metal that was radiating mysterious energy. Sorcerer Apollo did mention that Le Fay's ancestor was a level 3 great sorcerer. And this level 3 great sorcerer valued this mysterious metal greatly. This meant that this metal indeed had some secrets concealed in it. Doing his best to conceal his surprise, Grimm put up a smile as he received the metal. Then, as he extended one of his hands in the air, the miner slipped out from one of his sleeves. Cor Cor. Dear Le Fay, my master Grimm said he loves you ten thousands. After the loud proclamation, Miner tapped his tail proudly as he looked at everyone in the shrine. There was an uproar as soon as they saw the miner. They stared at the miner and started to discuss. Oh, what a beautiful parrot. Oh my, he had taught the parrot so many words, and he made it speak this many words. So, the night Grimm fell in love for our governor Le Fay for a long long time now. Miner had caught everyone's attention in such a short time. Though he was a little upset that they called him a parrot. Grimm looked at Le Fay lovingly and then put Miner on her shoulder. His name is Mavrika Nevichi. With him by your side, I will always be with you. Always. Gently caressed Miner's feather, Le Fay closed her eyes and was able to sense that he had the same presence and scent as Grimm's. Pressing her face against the parrot, tears of joy rolled down her cheek as she nodded her head. Chapter 284 Farce Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation. Such a romantic hour. The only thing missing now was music ringing in the air and the beginning of a dance. However. Whoosh. Yelps of surprise could be heard outside of the wedding shrine. Grimm and Nina York sensed a peculiar presence and looked at one another. Sorcerer. Thick layers of elemental energy were rolling in the sky. A bright sorcerer bellowed loudly as he hovered in the air, I am looking for Le Fay, the governor of Bysir City. Show yourself now. In that moment, the furious sorcerer's terrifying presence had sent the entire Bysir City into a panic. The knights quickly summoned their crossbow units and stood ready for battle. No one dared to move a muscle. Stepping out of the wedding shrine, Le Fay replied loudly, I am Le Fay. The moment the deantlered bright sorcerer saw Le Fay in her wedding gown, he felt a fling of hesitation. He wondered if this was the appropriate timing to inquire about the legendary knight whom he was planning to sign a contract with. Then, his face suddenly turned grim. This presence. Grim, who was inside the shrine felt something was off too. The reason he left Minor with Le Fay was to not only enable him to always teleport to Le Fay's side but also to cover Le Fay's black sorcerer scent. Yet this bright sorcerer was sharp. You. Come over here. The deantlered sorcerer pointed at Le Fay and shouted. Panicking, Le Fay turned to Grimm and Nina York seeking for their help. Suddenly, 
She let out horrified shrieks as her body levitated in the air and darted toward the bright sorcerer. Ah! Lord Le Fay! Fire your arrows! Whoosh! 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 Several dozen arrows were shot at the deantlered sorcerer. Angered by this, the deantlered sorcerer charged up a fireball and prepared to launch at the knights. How dare you disrespect a sorcerer! You're dead! Before the deantlered sorcerer was able to finish his words, suddenly a cold voice could be heard from above his head. His voice was so cold and unnerving that it felt like it was a voice from hell itself. Feeling a freezing chill down his spine, the bright sorcerer quickly used his arm to extend elemental energy to defend himself. Boom boom. Shockwaves rippled across the sky as his elemental energy exploded. Anxiously landing on the ground, the deantlered sorcerer looked up to the sky to check what was going on. He saw Grimm, dressed in a full noble suit, shielding Le Fay behind him as he raised his hand at him. His eyes were icy cold while his hand was accumulating various raging elemental energy. Furious, Grimm had locked on his eyes onto the deantlered sorcerer, preparing to strike any moment. Yet, he was hesitating. Should he kill on his big day? It was this hesitation that stopped Grimm from going full assault. A dark demon hunter. It's a dark demon hunter and sorcerer apprentice wedding. The deantlered sorcerer shouted in surprise. Then, he felt another powerful presence nearby. A quick scan had drawn his attention to Nina York, another elderly sorceress who was leering at him at a distance. Another sorceress. Realized that he was outnumbered and at a disadvantage, sweat rolled down on the deantlered sorcerer's back. This was bad. He did not only disrespect a sorcerer, the said sorcerer was a bloodlusting demon hunter. On top of that, he was a dark demon hunter. Dark demon hunters were terrifying monsters who conquered foreign worlds, leaving seas of corpses behind. This was bad, bad indeed. The deantlered bright sorcerer anxiously started to think of a way out of this. If he handled this lightly, things could really go out of hand. Then, he noticed that all the horrified, angered citizens' eyes were staring at the fireball in his hand. Fireball? Suddenly, the deantlered sorcerer roared cheerfully. Ha ha ha! I'm a sorcerer from Lilith Sorcerer Academy. I'm here to congratulate Le Fay on her marriage. There is no need to panic. Ha ha ha! Then, he quickly hurled the fireball into the sky. Boom boom boom! The fireballs exploded into colorful fireworks. Wow! Children watched the beautiful fireworks in the sky in awe. The fireworks were lit by a sorcerer, thus, it was indeed quite a sight. Then, everyone turned their eyes on the deantlered sorcerer again. This time, their eyes were filled with confusion. So, it was just a mere misunderstanding. And the fireworks. They're so beautiful. So, that sorcery. Grimm looked at the bright sorcerer in surprise. Looking at the citizens who were appreciating the fireworks, Grimm let out a cold grunt as he suppressed his anger and leered at the bright sorcerer. A moment later, the bright antlered sorcerer put up a friendly face and brought a gift box to Grimm as he stopped the fireworks. He he, a oh great demon hunter. It's all a misunderstanding. I'm just here to light up the fireworks to lighten the mood. You know, to congratulate on your marriage. Grimm almost burst out in laughter seeing this. He curtly received the gift box and coldly replied, Go. The deantlered sorcerer was stunned for a short while before he smiled at Grimm, Le Fay, and Nina York then zoomed out of their view. Meanwhile, several citizens pointed at Grimm and exclaimed excitedly, Look! Grimm must be a legendary knight! His flying! His flying with Lord Le Fay. In the eyes of these citizens, legendary knights and sorcerers were mysterious and powerful. As for the actual objective comparison between the strength of legendary knights and sorcerers, 
It was not like how they were described in fairy tales though. On the ground, countless crossbow-wielding knights were staring at Grimm, the perfect man with gratitude. Unlike the others, they knew what was going on earlier. They could feel they were standing at the edge of death. That sorcerer was definitely an enemy. Yet, the terrifying sorcerer was spooked by Grimm, he went so far as to light up fireworks to cheer up the civilians, letting go of his dignity. This, this was so unthinkable. Just who was Grimm? In fact, thinking back, everything about him in the past three months were filled with mysteries. Although they had spent three months together eating and drinking countless times, no one ever saw him showing any sign of weakness at all. However, no one treated him as their true friend. His eyes always seemed to tell the knights that were trying to befriend him that he was just a passerby. Turning around, Grim held Lefay's anxious hands and smiled. Don't worry. I'm here. After the crazy farce, everyone purposely avoided in mentioning what had happened before and threw themselves happily in the dancing pool when night fell. Chapter 285 Honeymoon Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation Three months later, on the eastern coral island. On a vast grassland, one with flowers covered everywhere. A grassland that rarely had visitors. Ha ha ha, Grim. Now can you guess how many strawberries I have in my hand? Don't use sorcery. No cheating. Her voice was sublime in the ears. It was like listening to the singing of a lark. Walking backward as she faced Grim, Lefay's face was glowing with a sweet smile as she extended her fair exquisite fists all the while they were stepping on the green pasture, with butterflies and hummingbirds buzzing by. Cor cor. Master, I think there are three berries in her hand. Mina smirked as it stood on Lefay's shoulder. It was the one who took out the strawberries from the pocket dimension. Yet, it was feeding misinformation to Grimm, trying to disrupt his induction process. Mina stood on Lefay's side, using Grimm's love for Lefay as his advantage to bully him. However, Grimm seemed to enjoy this a lot. Grimm grinned as he gazed into Lefay's smiling crescent eyes and then into Mina's mischievous full moon eyes. After a moment's thought, Grimm answered, my guess is, you don't have any strawberries in your hand at all. Cor cor. Ea. Mina jumped excitedly on Lefay's shoulder. Ha ha, Grim you've guessed wrong. I've got two strawberries over here. Come, Mina. We'll share the strawberries. You'll take one and I'll take one. We'll watch him drool. Lefay then took a strawberry and tossed it into her mouth while Mina quickly devoured the other. Giggling mischievously as she chewed the strawberry in her mouth, Lefay said, Grim, it's your turn to pick some strawberries. It's our turn to guess. You know, to be fair. Fair? How was this fair? Grim had only one go to guess the berries in Lefay's hand, on the other hand, Lefay and Mina each had a turn to guess, so they had two chances. Still, after seeing the coquettish Lefay before him, all that Grimm could feel was a whirlpool of sweet feelings. Grimm once thought that he would always be a wise rational sorcerer. Yet now, he realized he was the living example of another sorcerer's words. A sorcerer who's in love is like a newborn baby. And it was true. Grimm was like a kid who only lived for three hundred years, he easily fell for the trap and took out a handful of strawberries with a foolish grin, sure, take a guess. 2. Mina quickly yelled out its answer, like the forever immature stupid bird that it was. Hem, 3. Lefay nervously squealed out her answer. Then, Grimm slowly opened up his palm. There were three strawberries. Mina and Lefay jumped excitedly as they grabbed the strawberries from Grimm's hand. They happily devoured the berries in front of Grimm. Now, it's your turn to guess. Thus, they kept on going as they walked. Grimm and Lefay were like a wandering loving married couple. 
They were enjoying every minute as they felt their heartbeats sinking up as one. At a small farm. Grim had rented the whole place up for a night with the steep price of one silver coin. Lefay was tightly cuddled in Grim's arm as they lay on a mattress, watching millions of stars above in the sky. Creak creak creak. Countless insects and bugs were flying and singing under the cloak of night. It was like listening to nature's symphony. In the sky, there were several clouds hanging in the air while the crescent moon was hiding behind them. It looked as though the moon was a mischievous child enjoying a bubble bath. Grim, I suppose we'll be reaching Krakato Harbor tomorrow? Lefay's words were soft, vibrating from her throat. It was so soft that only Grim could hear from his ears. Every breath that escaped from her nose and touched his ears felt so warm. Feeling the warmth in his arms, Grim hugged his wife tighter as he gave a firm yes. Then, his hands were beginning some, mischievous fondles. The night was so silent, romantic and warm. Everything felt so nice and serene, and there appeared to be only Grim and Le Fay in the area. Yet. Cor Cor, master. I've got something here. It's a neon bird. A neon bird. It's so unthinkable for us to find such a creature from the ancient times over here at the eastern coral island. It's so unthinkable. Master, come. We should. Cough cough. Grim let out two fake coughs before quickly separating from Le Fay as he glared at this stupid bird. Just what time did it think it was? Grim did not have the mood to catch some prehistoric bird at all. Um. Minor, could you please head into the pocket dimension and hit the sack? Le Fay and I have something to discuss. Grim put on a solemn face as he spoke to Minor, like there was some important business going on. Oh, what are you discussing? Minor asked as its idiotic excitement still overwhelmed him. Stunned, Grim almost burst out in laughter seeing this stupid bird's naivety. He quickly grabbed Minor and threw him into the pocket dimension as he scolded, what we're discussing. What thing? Just scram. Don't you dare give me that innocent look. Cor. Cool. Minor screeched as it disappeared into the pocket dimension. The farm was now quiet again. Grim grinned as he looked at Lefay. Ah, you baddie. Just what do you think you're, doing? Le Fay giggled as she pushed Grim's chest away with her hands. Grim let out a mischievous laugh and answered, What I'm doing? Of course I'm doing you. Come, little lamb. Allow the big bad wolf in. Stunned after hearing this, Le Fay quickly realized what Grim meant. Teehee, you're such a baddie. We'll never know just who the little lamb is yet. Come, little grim lamb your big sis wolf is hungry. You're not going to escape my paws. Then, cheerful giggles and laughs could be heard larking in the quiet farm. Next evening. At the Krakato Duke's mansion. Grim and Lefay sat together as they raised their wine glasses to the retired sorcerer who invited them and Apollo to a feast in the eastern coral island. A warm smile beamed on the Duke's face. There was also a glimpse of regret on his face too. Oh, how I haven't thought that the two most anticipated candidates out of the hundreds of sorcerer apprentices on the Dilla will did not rank up to be full-fledged sorcerers at all. In fact, there was only one of them succeeded in ranking up from the Holy Tower qualification battle. Yet, there were you and Nina York, the prodigies that were hidden amongst waves after waves of the ordinary sorcerer apprentices. Such a shame. It's such a shame that now Grimm and Nina York had become the full-fledged sorcerers for Black Isotta. After exchanging words, the Duke, Grimm and Le Fay took a full gulp of the wine from their glasses. After Grimm's wedding, Nina York had travelled back to Black Isotta Sorcerer Academy. She had also agreed to keep Le Fay's information a secret. In exchange for that, Nina York had acquired Le Fay's grandfather's secret lab in Bysir City making Bysir City her second home. In the grand feast, 
Graham and the Duke were chatting for a full two-hour glass time before ending his visit. The Duke made a promise to Grimm that he would gift Grimm the small castle that he once lived on at Krakato Harbour. On a well-lit street, Grimm and Le Fay were strolling slowly as they held hands, passing by countless other citizens. So where are we going? How about we head to your castle, maybe we'll play that little game, like how I visited your chamber two hundred years ago. Hem? My dear little Grimm? Le Fay teasingly looked at Grimm. Letting a few fake coughs, Grimm replied with a smile, Um, let's bring you to the dim well. I can still remember the night Robinson brought me to the place. Oh, the memories. After a while. They arrived at the small mysterious house. Under the moonlight, a maple tree was swaying against the wind as it cast its shadow on the windows. It felt as though it was a palm, holding an infinite amount of sadness within. There was a well next to the house. Some youngsters' laughter could be heard in the area, they appeared to be entertained by something. Grimm and Le Fay were amongst these youngsters. Creek. Entering the house, Grimm took out a few gold coins from his pocket and looked at the elderly sorceress. The old sorceress too looked at Grimm. He originally thought this old sorceress was just another colleague who was hiding her real appearance using sorcery. Yet, she was not breathing. How could this be? A mechanical marionette. As Grimm was surprised by this revelation, the old sorceress opened her mouth, revealing two rows of blackened teeth within. Then, a sapling grew from within her throat. The sapling let out an angry puff. Oh young sorcerer, don't you know no sorcerer higher than level one is allowed to approach the eye of the world? Grimm's eyes were widening as he saw this. This, this was the breath of the spring world guardian. One of the two most powerful world guardians. Caught off guard, Grimm quickly pulled Le Fay, who was still clueless as to what to do, to his side and bowed to the sapling. Although the sapling was just an exemplification of the real world guardian, it still held immense authority, one that Grimm must look up to. The sapling shook its body before continuing on, HMPH, I see. You don't know. Now, make sure you don't leak out information about the eye of the world. Grimm quickly replied, yes, of course. Then, after a short hesitation, Grimm asked, oh dear great world guardian, my wife is just a sorcerer apprentice, would you mind? Tud. The sapling tossed a rock at Grimm, take it. Don't worry, I'll give this out for free this time. No gold coin needed. After that, the sapling quickly crawled back into the old sorceress throat. Half an hour glass time later, Le Fay giggled as she held Grimm's arm while they walked to the sea view castle. Did you see that? That creature only has one head. And there are many tentacles beneath it. Anne, and it was hovering in the air as it spoke to me. Oh, I was so surprised, and then that was not all. Chapter 286, Demon Hunter Consociation Meanwhile, at the edge of Seven Ring Holy Tower's territory, around the vicious thorn forest. Shasasasasasa. Hatori the Hidden. This bounty of the so-called demon hunting mission, can only be mine to claim. Seven Ring Holy Tower. Shasasasa. You ignorant kitten. It's time to end your happy vacation at the Sorcerer Continent. I'll have you experience just what real fear is. Tremble. Fear me. Shasasasa. This dark demon hunter had a pair of cold taciturn eyes, ones that were beaming dark crimson light. There was a shroud of grey flame floating above his head while his five bony fingers each had a skeleton-shaped ring. Keeping his ricketed body balanced with a magic staff, he opened his mouth and laughed maniacally. This dark demon hunter appeared to be much more malicious than the cruel black sorcerers. Sniff. At sacred ruined Vale, a demon hunter clad in pale white bone armor was standing in the middle of the desert as his Cerberus was sniffing a black sorcerer apprentice corpse. The Cerberus had an extra, 
third eye on its forehead. It seemed to be a kind of rare mutated Cerberus. Any leads, Pague. The bone armored demon hunter asked his Cerberus. Hum, still no luck. Although I can confirm that there's a certain connection between the symbiotic insect implanted here and the brass herter bug. Yet, this black sorcerer is quite skilled at hiding. I am still unable to detect his exact location. The bone armored demon hunter looked at a flock of white birds that were flying across the sky and replied coldly, Ah, I see. Black Isota Sorcerer Academy. A black robe wearing demon hunter landed on the ground. Boom. The stone pallets beneath his feet creaked open and formed a pair of one meter large footprints. Slam. A huge crocodile tail emerged from his robe and slapped on the stone pallets with its metallic scales shining brightly. Crew crew. A black isota guardian owl flew over and landed on a high ground in front of the demon hunter and loudly proclaimed, assignment from the demon hunter consociation. Track down and slay Hartori the hidden, a black sorcerer who is currently hiding within the territory of the seven ring holy tower. Then, a bright ray shone on the demon hunter's sorcerer barrier, it had two rank three honor badges imprinted on it. Crew. Crew. The guardian owl flew away right after completing its task. A moment later, the level three academy head slowly hovered out from beneath Master Pirano's floor, as if riding on a shroud of watery mist. Gabriel, you're back. Bone Bell Tower Academy. Slam. Two demon hunters were sitting at a table. The two-meter-tall muscular sorcerer, clad in full metallic armor, slammed his enormous hand on the table. Curses! The Seven Ring Holy Tower finally caught wind of our academy's scandal. They even approved the Demon Hunter Consociation to pass down a demon hunting mission to gather up the best demon hunters of the same rank just to hunt down that cursed degenerate. After this incident, we, the Bone Bell Tower Academy will lose our reputation and struggle to recover from it in the next thousands of years. Damn it. Another demon hunter, a sorceress sat calmly on the sofa and replied coldly, there's only one way to turn this around, we will have to deal with this traitor ourselves. HMPH, the Holy Tower has underestimated this Hartori too. How could they treat the important task of eliminating the genius black sorcerer like a game? Slam! The table shook violently as the giant demon hunter slammed his fists onto it. Looks like we'll have to request the academy to increase the tracking effort. We must head to the location where that tracking sorcerer was killed, to see if there's any lead. Sigh. All right. That kid who could secure an honor badge during his level 1 sorcerer days. We'll have to send out elite demon hunters who are extremely capable. We must do our best. Spreading their dusky bat wings, the sorceress and sorcerer both flew out of the room. Umbra Sorcerer Academy. A young beautiful blonde sorceress lifted her long golden hair up in the air by utilizing nature's elemental energies as she wrote magical arrays and runes on a high-end table. Every single rune was shining scarlet blood rays and formed neatly together. Thousands of runes blinked in an orderly rhythm, as if they were singing an ode. And the blonde sorceress, she was the strongest sorcerer apprentice thousands of years ago in that holy tower qualification battle the representative of Umbra Sorcerer Academy. She was the renowned demon Kisakuriak. Her fame amongst the six sorcerer academies was almost as well known as the recent Pale Mask Grim. And now, she was back, with the extreme capability and prowess of a level one sorceress, basking her left hand in evaporating scarlet red magic ink. As layer after layer of scarlet magic runes were sketched down, a star brightly shone in the sky before curtaining down a cloak of emerald starlight onto the altar that she was completing her pen work. Then, the sky returned to normal, the usual sinister scarlet red night. This altar, the cursed altar seemed to be reacting to a certain law of the sorcerer world. Kuriak, seeing you now reminded me of the first time we met. It was that day that I'm certain that you're a genius at curses. 
Now look at you, you've indeed shown your worth. Your name will surely be imprinted in the books of history. In fact, you might even surpass me as a sorceress, a level two elderly sorceress in a black scarf proclaimed with her hoarse voice. Kuriak's eyes curved like the crescent moon as she smiled sweetly, so sweet that she did not look like a cruel, bloodthirsty dark sorceress at all. Master, without your guidance, how would I achieve what I have today? After replying humbly, Kuriak swiftly picked up a symbiotic insect out from a black sorcerer apprentice's head, provided as a research sample, while conjuring out a magic interdiction with the other hand. Poof! The black sorcerer apprentice, almost instantly, exploded into a screen of bloody mist. Unfazed, Kuriak picked up a small tumor and giggled. Now, allow me to observe just what kind of materials these Hartori's creatures needed to resist against curse sorcery. Despair Collector Tihi, well, its strongest side, surely is also its true weakness. There were more and more honor badge bearers flocked towards the compounds of the six sorcerer academies. They were all elite demon hunters, proficient in elemental energies and combats. In fact, they were all masters in combat. They were all survivors and masters of combats after surviving from various and various of foreign land conquests. They possessed strong unshaken fighting will and skills. Their ability to think on their feet and fighting versatility were far greater than any arcane sorcerers who were on the same rank. And only these combat veterans could complete this one task, to hunt down and slay a black sorcerer. Several days later. At the vicious thorn forest. Arg. It couldn't be. Hattori the hidden leaped out of a gigantic tree with a loud excruciating screech. His skin was covered in hundreds of red goosebumps. Then, these goosebumps exploded into red bloody vapors in the air forming vapors of skulls kissing one another in the air. Realizing something was off, Hattori the hidden quickly hid in the giant tree. A short moment later, his body extended out from another stone wall several dozen meters away. Creak. The giant tree snapped in half as its massive trunk started to bend as its leaves began to turn yellow and dry. The thousand-year-old gigantic tree had turned into a pile of rotten wood in mere minutes. Seeing this, Hattori the Hidden mumbled with a pale face, it can't be. They used my symbiotic insect to curse me. They even broke through my brass hair to tuba and dusk skull shackle. Now all that I can do is to use the blood of the world to shift the curses. As Hattori closed his eyes, his exposed flesh and bones due to the explosion earlier had begun to grow layers and layers of leaves, rocks, and sand, and quickly heal up into new parts of his body. It would appear that I had attracted the attention of the Seven Ring Holy Tower. I can't stay here any longer. I must head to the Black Domain, Hartori the Hidden mumbled. However, it's quite apparent that this cursed sorcery could only work when I'm at my weakest state. Anne, they'll also need to utilize my brass hair to bugs, huh? Hee <laughs> hee, my weakest state only occurs for 15 seconds per month, so that's fine. As for the brass hair to bugs, it's time to recall them back to me. Chapter 287, Agony Ah! A piercing shriek rocked Grim awake from his deep slumber. Le Fay! Are you alright? Sitting on the bed, Grim worriedly looked at Lefay, she was grabbing her head, twitching in pain and agony. It's the brass herter bugs. They're calling me. Grim. I'm. I'm going to die. I'm going to. Ugh. Brass herter bugs, the name of Hartori the hidden symbiotic insects. The official academic name for the insects was Hartori bugs. Grabbing tightly the tumor on her head, tears ran steadily down Lefay's cheek. She gazed at Grimm with her eyes filled with regrets and reluctance of separation. Screams of agony kept going on and on as she struggled excruciatingly on the bed. Cor. We can't remove the insects from Lefay's body. Master Grimm, you should try sealing them for Lefay. 
flapping its wings in the air, Minor was worried as it looked at the tortured Le Fay. Sealing? Grim had only two ways of sealing. The first one was to use the green python thread a temporary and low-graded method, the other one was to draft up an energy conservation seal and seal them in his lab. Drafting up an energy conservation seal would consume a lot of time, thus, it was not suitable for the emergency at hand. Panicked, Grim quickly hurled out a green python thread from his pocket dimension and bandaged them on Lefay's head. In the meantime, he took out a potion using another hand and quickly loosened the cap before bringing the bottle to Lefay's nose. As she inhaled the potion, Lefay slipped into a deep sleep lessening her pain for now. Depressed by the situation at hand, Grim stared at Minor and asked, what happened? It's that black sorcerer. Somehow, he was provoked and started to recall his symbiotic insects. Minor's tone was unpleasant. Lefay was exceedingly kind to Minor, pampering it for the last few months. This had made Minor get attached to Lefay. Freaked out, Grim clenched his teeth as he marched around in his bedroom while watching the tormented Lefay. She had only a dozen years to live. Why couldn't she be left alone to live her final days in peace and quiet? Why must she suffer like this? Why couldn't he be given a chance to repent the wrongs he did for leaving her behind without saying goodbye? Why couldn't he at least be given the chance to live a normal love life? Suddenly, Grim stopped fidgeting around. What stupid ideas have you got now? Grim's sudden pause spooked Minor. Grim slowly pulled back his hands that were waving at Lefay with a sigh. I was hoping to try, to see if I could disintegrate these symbiotic insects. Minor immediately retorted with a yell, Are you out of your mind? You've seen it before. If the bugs feel threatened, they will explode right away. Are you trying to murder Lefay? Clenching his teeth again, Grim couldn't help but stand there as this helplessness stung him. After hesitating for a moment, Grim quickly slashed open his pocket dimension to equip his sorcerer robes and mask of truth. Quick. Take a piece of sorcerer essence and get Duke Krakato here to help design a seal for Lefay. I will head to the sorcerer continent to find Hattori. I will try to strike a deal with him, to have him to extract these bugs from Lefay's head. It was a crime to make any kind of deal with a black sorcerer in the sorcerer continent. And if the terms that the black sorcerer brought up included collecting live human specimens, this would mean Grimm would need to break more laws to honor the deal. Even though the Holy Tower eventually investigated and understood that this was done under a peculiar circumstance, Grimm would still suffer a decrease in three ranks on his honor badge. On top of that, there could also be at least hundreds of years of jail time waiting for him too. Yet, Grimm had made up his mind. So long as Hattori did not bring up any immoral condition that involved capturing live human specimens, he would agree to anything. Anything at all. This was all to right a wrong he made centuries ago. He wanted to make things right and amend this regret. Fine. Minor replied in a jaded tone. It was rare to see Minor displaying emotions like this. Grim clenched his teeth and slowly giving Minor his order, word by word. During the time of my absence, you must stay by Lefay's side. I need you to be there for her every single minute. If. If I can't get a deal done, I will return here the first moment I can to try disintegrate these bugs. After giving Minor his orders, Grim took a long gaze at Lefay, it felt almost like he was trying to paint a portrait of her, forever recording her beautiful face in his heart. Then, he swiftly turned and darted out of the window, toward the ocean. He knew he was about to commit a crime. Yet, this was something that he must do. This throbbing agony that he felt, it was so hellish that no word could describe it. Several days later. Above the surface of the jewel sea, a wonderful song could be heard as Grimm darted across the sky. Using his mask of truth, he was able to see what was going on on the sea surface. It was a bevy of sirens who were seducing sailors on a ship. 
These low-intelligent ocean creatures love to utilize simple sound-based mind-control sorcery to trick the sailors to think that they're mermaids, and when the sailors got caught off guard, they would then become the sirens' meals. The sirens were quite evil for a breed of ocean creatures. Of course, the veteran sailors had come prepared. They had brought some oddly shaped shells to cover their ears while shouting loudly, trying not to let the sound-based mind control get to them. Nonetheless, there were still some veterans who got caught and started to walk towards the edge of the deck with a euphoric smile on their faces. Suddenly, a siren noticed Grim. It then raised its head and started to sing its mind control sorcery at Grim. Like a barrel of gunpowder meeting a torch of fire, Grim got pissed off almost immediately. You asked for it. Flame spiraled around his left hand while clouds of frost formed on his right hand. Then, a dark scarlet energy ball started to form in the air before beamed out toward the sirens. The sirens' lower bodies resembled octopus while their upper body resembled that of naked disfigured ladies. Despite having very little intelligence, the sirens were able to sense a petrifying doomsday-like disaster darting right at their faces, thus, they quickly scattered into the water and fled into the depths of the sea. The moment the siren singing stopped, the euphoric sailors immediately snapped out of their confusion and quickly retreated back onto the deck. Boom! The brief silence was suddenly disturbed by an ear-piercing explosion, shocking all the sailors as they watched in horror with their hands covering their ears. A human silhouette held a 70 to 80 meter water pillar out of the tidal waves and then tore open the ocean in a square shape. Creek. The wooden ship was rocking back and forth along the fierce tidal waves, almost like it was going to shatter into pieces. Several sailors screamed in horror as they fell into the ocean. Sorcerer. Ah, it's a sorcerer. Hugging the mast and ropes of the ship, the sailors yelled loudly as waves and waves of ocean tides hit them and fed salt water into their mouths. There was a mix of appreciation and horror in their voices. Grim was fuming with anger while he heaved his attacks at his targets. To the sailors, it was like witnessing a personification of various apocalyptic typhoons and storms. No knight's power and might could come close to compete with the raw power that he displayed at this moment. Level 1 Wild Instinct Metamorphosis Activate Layers and layers of dingy sharp scales then started to float above Grim's body. Whoosh! In the blink of an eye, Grim dove straight into the raging ocean. In just a few short moments, Grim darted out from the ocean and continued on with his flight. There were countless corpses of sirens floating on the ocean surface as soon as he disappeared from everyone's sight. Then, several sharks, attracted by the siren's scent of blood, flocked over and started to gnaw on the siren's corpses. The sailors couldn't believe their eyes as they stared at the feasting sharks. So, this is the might of the great sorcerers. The sailors mumbled. In half a month of non-stop flying, Grimm had finally arrived at Black Isota Sorcerer Academy. Chapter 288, Gabriel. Translator. Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation On the 79th level of Black Isota As soon as Master Piranos opened the door he saw Grimm standing outside. Lowering his head, Grimm spoke in a trembling voice, Master, I am in need of your help. Help! Grimm, please come inside. After being momentarily stunned, Master Piranos invited Grimm into his living quarters. At the lobby, his wife Alice was combing Garnagal's fur. Oh, it's Grimm. Welcome. Have a seat. Alice smiled kindly as she beckoned Grimm to their sofa. After nodding politely to Alice, Grimm sat on the sofa opposite of Alice's. Garnigel stretched its body on Alice's lap and asked, So, what's going on with you, Grimm? I thought you went out to find your dear little lover. Why are you back? Master Pirano sat next to Alice and gave Grim a concerned look. Grim, it's all right. Tell us. What happened? What can I do for you? 
Master Piranos knew something was off. Grimm was now a full-fledged dark sorcerer, and he knew how Grimm was an immensely independent sorcerer. Thus, it was unusual for him to come seeking aid like this. Due to the long journey, Grimm was still gasping for air trying to recover the magic power that he had used up on the way. As his body started to recover, various elements were starting to accumulate around him. Seeing this, Garnigel realized it was a matter so urgent that Grimm had to hurry over. Using all the breath he could muster, Grimm uttered his request through his dry lips, It's my wife Le Fay. Hattori the Hidden, the black sorcerer who is currently being hunted by the Seven Rings, had implanted symbiotic insects in her. I need the Academy to send out mission requests to seek out Hattori and have him extract the insects from my wife's body. Pausing momentarily, Grimm continued on. I am willing to accept any of his conditions. Grimm had not revealed just how far he was willing to concede with Hartori. Master Pirano's wrinkled face twitched after hearing this. Striking a deal with a black sorcerer. Grimm, are you sure? Please, Master. Please help me. Grimm lowered his head and started to beg. Garnigel jumped off from Alice's lap and landed on the tea table in front of them, its emerald eyes staring at Grimm. Grimm, your request is unusually difficult. Due to the attention Hartori has drawn to himself, the Demon Hunter Consociation had issued a demon hunting mission to deal with him. Demon Hunter Consociation Grimm suddenly realized something. Unlike the bright sorcerers, who had formed the Dawn Sages after the First Civilization War, the Dark Sorcerers only formed their demon hunting organization after the Second Civilization War. The Dawn Sages followed the mindset of the sorcerers during and before the First Civilization War, they would only expand from within and would not resort to conflict unless for self-defense. As for demon hunters, they aimed to train sorcerers that were specialized in invading foreign worlds. The most famous and renowned members were the level 3 reconnaissance sorcerers. Grimm's eldest apprentice sister Quiet Spring was one of the Demon Hunter Consociation. The Demon Hunters Consociation usually assigned missions to level 1 to level 3 Demon Hunters at random, and through completing these missions repeatedly, the high achievers then got to join their ranks. As for Grimm, even he had acquired the qualification to join them, as he had now acquired a rank 3 on a badge. Lowering his head, Grimm said determinedly, no matter how difficult. I will do my best to save Le Fay. HMPH. Master Piranos coldly replied, Grimm, so you're determined to break the law of the Seven Rings and make dealings with a black sorcerer. Are you sure you won't regret later? Yes. Grimm's determined eyes could be seen through his mask of truth. Master Pirano's words did not shake his determination at all. On the other hand, Master Pirano's solemn face was now starting to loosen up. Looking at the water in a glass sitting on the tea table, he seemed to be recalling a memory from a distant past. After a long while, Master Pirano stood up and patted Grimm's shoulder. Then, to Grimm's surprise, Pirano sighed. As your teacher, I should warn you, no, stop you from doing this foolish act. To ensure you not leaving Black Isotta before Hattori dies. Well, that's perhaps if it's hundreds of years ago. Now. A short pause later, Master Piranos appeared to feel slight relief. Yet, as a level 3 great sorcerer, I have this to say. Go, go out there and give it your all. Live your life to the fullest. Grimm's eyes widened. He realized what Master Piranos was trying to convey, he was now not the little Grimm who lived under the shadow of Quiet Spring anymore. In his teacher's eyes, he was already an independent sorcerer with great potential. Meow, Grimm. If one day you rank up as a stigmata sorcerer, I suppose you won't have any issue dealing with your inner demons. You've got a good head on your shoulders. Garnigel scratched itself a while before continuing, regardless, after this whole thing passes, get prepared to stay in the Seven Rings prison for a few hundred years. 
The Holy Tower will never let you off lightly after dealing with a black sorcerer. To atone and allow Le Fay to live out her final decade in joy, a few hundred years off his lifespan was nothing to Grimm. In the eyes of the wise and intelligent dark sorcerers, Grimm's decision was utterly foolish. In fact, even Grimm was still a little hesitant despite his iron-willed determination. This would be an agonizing decision. A good head on his shoulders. After ranking up as a full-fledged sorcerer, Grimm had completely gotten used to the perspective of being a sorcerer. Indeed, he had the brains for it. One minute, two minutes, three minutes. After a total of fifteen minutes, Grimm raised his head and said, painfully and yet determinedly, yes, I've decided. This is the decision of my life. After saying it out loud, Grimm felt as if a heavy weight was lifted off of him. It felt as though after a long and weary fight between the cells of his entire body with his soul. It couldn't be helped, it was just an evolutionary process for them to lean towards the selfish route. If Grimm was determined to proceed with this decision, it was almost certain that he would be imprisoned. It would then affect these cells severely in their evolutionary process. Thus, they were fighting and resisting with all their might. Yet, Grimm's soul was telling him that this decision would determine just what his very existence would mean. If a living being was always choosing the right path and ignore his sentimental side, he would then not be a being that could determine his own destiny. He would just be trapped in the endless lazy season of the universe's logics, law, and order. He would just be a tiny gear that followed the rules. And self-determined destiny was uncertain. And yet, it was this uncertainty that led to endless possibilities, touching on a law that was higher than the universe's law. Ha ha! Good! Grim, perhaps you're not really suited to be a dark sorcerer after all. Perhaps, your soul is closer than that of a bright sorcerer. One day, I believe you will surpass me in quiet spring and venture into the realms of stigmata sorcerers. Master Piranos laughed aloud while still looking at Grim with relieved eyes. Although Grim was now supposed to be on the same level as Master Piranos in terms of perspective in life, he still could not understand what his teacher meant. After all, Grim had only just entered the field of sorcerer while Master Piranos was an acclaimed sorcerer for years. Grim, come on. I'll bring you to the old hag downstairs. Let's get her to give you every intel you need on Hattori the Hidden. These days, her apprentice Gabriel had acquired a lot of information about him. Moments later. Knock knock knock. On the 78th level of Black Isota. Master Piranos knocked on a door with Grimm standing next to him. Creak. The wooden door creaked open and an infant-like face reached out from within. The head of the academy looked at Master Piranos first then threw a surprised look at Grimm. Grimm? After acquiring the first place in the Holy Tower qualification battle, Grimm had the opportunity to meet her before. So, she too remembered Grimm. Master. Right after Grimm gave his bow, the head of the academy waved them into her living quarters. Hem? There's someone here. Grimm saw a black-robed sorcerer on the sofa. He then stared at Grimm while observing his demon hunter badge. His keen eyes also noticed that Grimm possessed superb constitution of a level 1 sorcerer. Master Pirano sat on the sofa and pointed at Grimm, this is my apprentice Grimm. He doesn't have any interest in this demon hunting mission. However, he needs intel about Hattori the Hidden from the Academy. You know, to gain more experience. Master Piranos withheld some details as he spoke. The head of the Academy and Gabriel looked at one another. A moment later, Gabriel smiled after whispering with the head of the Academy as he looked towards Grimm. Grimm was wearing a grey robe and mask of truth, there was nothing unusual and unique about him on the appearance. Since you're a high achiever in the academy and, according to Master Piranos, you don't intend to rival anyone in this demon hunting mission, then we're not each other's competition. Come with me a few days later. As he finished, 
Gabriel flashed his sorcerer badges in front of Grimm, two rows of rank three demon hunter honor badges. Chapter 289, Arcane Mount. Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation. Seven days later. The head of the academy quickly entered the room while a woodbracked bird flapped its wings rapidly on her fingertips. Teacher. Master. Gabriel and Grimm stood up to greet her. The head of the academy nodded her head and looked at Gabriel. Gabriel, about that demon hunter you've described, the academy had acquired the latest information in regards to that person. Then magic power started to rock around her lips as she spoke a series of chants and elemental passwords, the woodbracked bird loudly chirped before extending its wings and turned into a large leaf. There was a map drawn with a clear black arrow pointing at a direction on the leaf. Oh, he's heading towards the jewel sea. Gabriel, who was calm in the past few days, suddenly hastily jumped out of his chair and said, that's Rokuru. His ability in tracking is the best amongst us. His Cerberus would definitely be able to seek out the black sorcerer that Demon Hunter Consociation wants. Pausing momentarily, Gabriel continued on as he walked around excitedly in the room, and his heading toward the Jewel Sea. That means, the black sorcerer had taken notice and is planning to escape the sorcerer continent. He's heading towards the black domain. This is bad. Grimm didn't say a word. Although his eyes under the mask of truth were calm, his fists that were hidden in his sorcerer robe were clenching tightly while his uneven breathing showed some level of anxiety. No. They couldn't let Hattori the Hidden escape to the Black Domain. Just like how Sorcerer Continent was a gathering place for sorcerers, the Black Domain was one for the Black Sorcerers. Black Domain was a massive island, as huge as a continent. The humans who lived there were all lab rats to the black sorcerers, they were kept in cages, bred and sold like cattle. They lived all their lives locked inside the black sorcerers' labs, never experiencing freedom since their birth. And there were no black sorcerer apprentices. No civilians. No merchants. No knights. No nobles. There were only the black sorcerers and the dismembered. Other than the breeders, whose sole purpose was to breed continuously to increase the human's number, only the dismembered were allowed to live inside the black sorcerer's labs. And amongst those dismembered, only an extremely few number of them would experience extreme despair, one that surpassed life and death. These dismembered would then become the blackened. The blackened had not acquired any black sorcery from the experiments, making them ordinary humans with sorcery potentials. Nonetheless, they had indeed evolved into sorcerers. As soon as these blackened appeared, the black sorcerers would then carefully transport them to the black domain tower in exchange for sorcerer essence. In short, the black domain was a totally different world compared to the sorcerer continent. Grimm would not be able to hunt down a black sorcerer in their turf, it would not only be extremely difficult, it would be suicidal. As for the black sorcerers in the black domain, the sorcerer continent was like a massive treasure continent, littered with countless hateful demon hunters. The continent contained the treasure that the black sorcerers valued a lot vast human population. Thus, although dangerous, there were always some black sorcerers sneaking into sorcerer continent to wreak havoc. No. I must head to the jewel sea right away. I must complete the demon hunting mission before he leaves the sorcerer continent to kill him before he flies out of the continent's authority. Gabriel's words were cold and calm. Standing next to Gabriel, Grimm made himself look like he was indeed his sidekick, he was there solely to acquire more experience in demon hunting. Whoosh! The leaf on the head of the academy's hand suddenly turned into dust. Her face turned grim. Oh no, the tracking sorcerer had been spotted. The sorcerer continent was never a land of peace after all. Without hesitation, Gabriel quickly whooshed out of the 78th level's window. As he flew in the air, he loudly shouted towards the room, Goodbye, teacher. 
Master, thank you. After giving his thanks and bowing, Grimm suddenly disappeared from the room after a dimension distortion wrapped around him. In mere seconds, there was only the head of the academy left in the room. She coldly mumbled, let's hope this Grimm, like Master Pirano said, is not going to stab Gabriel in the back to compete in the Demon Hunter Consociation mission. Or else. HMPH, even if it's Master Pirano's, I will let him know just what consequence he would face if he lies to a level 3 great sorcerer. On the other hand, Grimm was looking enviously at the metal bird that Gabriel was riding. That was an arcane mount. It could carry a sorcerer to travel in the air. Well, flying in the air was not anything unique in the world of sorcerers. However, these arcane mounts could not only carry its rider long distances but also increase its flying speed gradually along the way without the fear of it getting tired. According to Grimm's estimation, Gabriel's metal bird could speed up to its maximum speed in just one day. And when that time came, Grimm would probably need to use dimension distortion to keep up. Gabriel threw a glance at Grimm who was tagging behind. Even though Master Piranos gave him his word, Gabriel did not believe at all that Grimm was not interested in completing the demon hunting mission at all. However, there were only a total of seven people participating in this mission. Every single one of them was elites who had survived countless foreign world conquests. Each one of them had honor badges on them. Thus, they were all powerful. Way more powerful than any ordinary sorcerers. He must be vigilant, no matter how strong he was. Thus, if he could use Grimm's service and aid properly, Gabriel could slow at least one of these competitors down and raising his chance to complete the hunt himself. After all, even though Grimm was a greenhorn, and had only graduated just 200 years ago, he was still the high achiever who had acquired the number one place in the Holy Tower qualification battle. Other than that, he had also acquired honor badges from his first demon hunting mission. This kid was indeed a genius sorcerer, one with immense potential. This demon hunting mission, to Gabriel, was not difficult at all. Any single one of them was not anything that the black sorcerer could take on at all. No, the real difficulty was the rivalry between the demon hunters. Feeling uneasy after this thought, Gabriel yelled at Grimm, just how long are you going to slow me down? HMPH, come and ride with me. I'm not going to wait for a deadweight you know. A deadweight? Grim was of the same level as him. Grim coldly replied, all right. Then, as a series of dimension distortion walked around them, Grim had landed on the metal bird. Gabriel, of course, had noticed Grim's disgruntlement. Yet, he didn't think this was anything to be concerned with. This kid was some brat that relied on his teacher to get the position to tag him along, to acquire more experience. They were just using one another, that's all. Nonetheless, he was the one in charge. Smiling coldly, Gabriel hid his face under his sorcerer robes, one that was flapped around with powerful elemental energy while retracting the metal scaled tail into the robe. Three days later. The metal bird was fast indeed. Gabriel and Grimm had now arrived at the edge between the vicious thorn forest and jewel sea. Gabriel quickly put away his metal bird. The two sorcerers then started to scan their surroundings as they hovered in the air. Creak creak creak. Grimm noticed that Gabriel raised an arm, his arm had a layer of metal scales, ones that started to sink into his skin, making a series of creaking noise. Hem. Wild Instinct Anatomy. So, Gabriel was a Wild Instinct Anatomy refinery sorcerer. He could remain in his Wild Instinct Level 1 form and still not become weakened. He had essentially become a wild beast. It would seem that this Gabriel was much more powerful than he first thought. He probably had mastered Level 2 form of Wild Instinct too. It was rare to see anatomy refinery sorcerer like Grimm. Grimm once accidentally activated level 1 wild instinct before when he was training his body and constitution continuously using various elements back then. 
Grimm deduced that the reason he was able to activate wild instinct was probably connected to the life code rupture. Thus, this could be a clue for him to continue his research on life code knowledge. This deduction would probably affect his future research after he completed his study on destructive force. A few moments later, Gabriel shook his head as he extracted his metal scales back on his skin again, no good. I'm not experienced in tracking using perception sorcery. The tracking sorcerer, that the head of the academy mentioned three days ago, last appeared here. Turning his head, Gabriel looked at the low profile, silent Grimm. Scanning Grimm behind the vapor of elements around him, Gabriel was looking at Grimm like how a senior would at a junior in the academy. Other than this weird gray mask, there doesn't appear to be anything unique about him, Gabriel thought. Then, he asked, so how's your perception sorcery? Come on, are you going to aid me or what? Grimm wasn't pleased with his disrespectful tone. Not saying a word, Grimm closed his eyes and focused on activating his perception. After about fifteen minutes, he suddenly opened his eyes and raised a finger in a direction, a few thousand meters away in that direction. There's a scent of death. Chapter 290 Weakening Wild Instinct Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation Whoosh whoosh Two sorcerers zoomed across thousands of meters, leaving mirror images along the way. Thud! Both of them landed on the ground. Hem? Grim did not inspect the corpse that was lying in front of him but instead turned to look at Gabriel, who was standing behind him. Both of them rushed to their destination hastily. When they landed, Grim did not make a sound at all. Gabriel, on the other hand, shook the ground so much that it felt like he had caused a tremor, leaving massive cracked footprints beneath his feet. It looked like that one time Millie and Mina releasing their high-level sorcery in full. Or that one time Black Eye Sota sorcerer stepped on the ancient ruin's metal ground, leaving some distorted footprints. Or like the ancient sorcerer's death leaving sacred traces across the world. These were the result of sorcerers not able to control their power precisely which in turn caused their energy to overflow from their bodies and caused destructive phenomena around them. One could say that this was the result of them having bad control of their own power, yet, the reality was, their basic attributes had surpassed that of any ordinary sorcerer on their level. Thud! 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 Gabriel did not pay attention to Grim who looking at him. He had gotten used to the other weaker sorcerers staring at him and observing him from a distance. Instead, he slowly walked towards the corpse. This was a sorcerer. The cause of death was him receiving fatal strikes to his abdomen and the back of the head. The abdomen was stabbed by some kind of sharp object, the back of his head, though, had a gruesome bloody hole it would appear that it had been torn out by some outside force there was nothing inside the hole. Nothing at all. After observing for a while, Gabriel smiled. HMPH, it's the works of Rokiru. His Cerberus will usually suck out its prey's brain, to replenish the energy of its eye of death. After finishing his sentence, Gabriel turned and pointed a finger at the corpse almost like summoning his soul slave to look at the corpse. Grim silently crouched next to the corpse and placed his nose close to the corpse's wounds. After a brief sniffing, he closed his eyes and started to analyze. A while later, Grim stood up and pointed at a certain direction towards the dual sea. They've gone that way. But. Gabriel, who was preparing to engage flight, frowned, but what? But other than the sense of Rokiru and his Cerberus, another sorcerer had been here before. Grim replied as he looked at Gabriel. Hem? Another one. Let's hope, it's not him. As he mumbled, Gabriel quickly rode on his metal bird and flew towards the direction that Grim was pointing at. Seeing this, Grim quickly used his dimension distortion to tail him. Three days later. Grim, 
who was flying at full speed above the dual sea suddenly pointed out, indeed, it's this direction. Now I can clearly pick up their scents. Riding on his metal bird, Gabriel asked, how about the other scent that you mentioned? Is he here too? Nodding his head, Grim replied, yes. Gabriel's face turned grim after hearing this. However, Grim was not able to see his facial expression due to the elemental vapors that were floating around him. It would appear that there was a participant that even Gabriel was afraid of. Grim and Gabriel thus kept flying at full speed. Half a day later, Grim was able to smell the scents clearer and clearer. In fact, along the way he could sense that there were some elemental energies scattered around unevenly. These were indications that fierce battles had occurred along the way. They were close to their target. Overwhelmed by hatred, Grim's heart was beating violently. His hatred for Hartori the Hidden, his hatred for him implanting symbiotic insects into Le Fay and forcing her to become a black sorcerer apprentice. This, in turn, forced her to carry a bounty on her head and to be hunted by demon hunters, she was forced to go through all these without any legitimate means of getting help. Grim was worried too. He was worried that Hattori not willing to deal with him or coming up with some extremely difficult condition. This would essentially close up Le Fay's survival chances entirely. Grim was feeling so crossed and frustrated as he was now entirely on the passive. He was forced to give in due to his weakness was being exploited. Even though energy sealing could aid in ensuring Le Fay's survival, Grim knew this was just a temporary solution. Besides, even if he was able to seal her up using some extremely powerful seal, living inside a seal for an extra decade was no different than dying. What Grimm wanted was to repent. He wanted to at least have some sweet memories on this journey of being a sorcerer. Thus, he would fight for it with all his might. He would not settle for some deluded comfort by agreeing to some form of compromise. On the other hand, Grimm had asked Miner to spend a vast amount of sorcerer essence to have Duke Krakato seal Le Fay. Without Grimm being around, Krakato would definitely notice Le Fay was a black sorcerer apprentice. However, he would assume that Grimm did not want to release the black sorcerer apprentice out to cause havoc in the world and break the laws of the Holy Tower but was not able to kill her due to her being his wife, thus, he needed Krakato to seal her. She was just a sorcerer apprentice. Thus, with a little bit of bribe and them being on the same level as sorcerers, he would not kill her. Hem? As Grim was deep in his thought, Gabriel let out a cough and pulled him back to the task at hand. He could see a ray of scarlet light flashing in a distance. No, not him too? Gabriel mumbled. As they got closer to the scarlet light, Grim was able to see what that was, it was a male sorcerer wearing some sort of sorcery tool on his sorcerer robes, releasing raging flames around him. Hem. So, this was due to the feathers. Grim noticed the scarlet red feathers on the demon hunter's robe. The secret of how the robe was releasing all those flames was the feathers. Gabriel, finally you show up. Third Ghost Pepper and Kuriak have already engaged with the target. I am not able to compete with them, but if I could stop you from going after the target, Kuriak would definitely pay me handsomely. He 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 he. The demon hunter leered at Gabriel as he darted towards them like a meteorite falling from the sky. In his eyes, his target was only Gabriel. He had completely ignored Grimm. Kuriak's bounty was to take down Gabriel. Even if he killed Grimm, there was no extra reward anyway. Curses! Not only that darn third ghost pepper is here, even Kuriak's here. This is the worst. Damn you, Rokiru. If I've known this, I should have ditched him in that demon hunting mission. So, he had joined forces with Kuriak. From their words, Grim could deduce what was going on. These demon hunters knew one another from one of the demon hunting missions. They even knew each other's combat capability through some kind of conflict it seemed. Hustling his metal bird, Gabriel suddenly turned and ordered, Grim, 
I'll leave him to you. Don't worry. I'll pay you 50 sorcerer essence later no matter I succeed in clearing the demon hunter consociation mission or not. Slap. 50 sorcerer essences had appeared. And they were thrown at Gabriel. Those were thrown from Grimm's hand. Shocked at his action, Gabriel asked, You? What is the meaning of this? Grimm coldly replied, This is your 50 sorcerer essence reward. I'll resume onwards. Don't worry. Like what Master Pirano said, I'm not interested in that demon hunter consociation mission. You can count on that. And I'm not your slave, you moron. Grim had suffered enough from Gabriel's arrogance. If it wasn't for Master Pirano's and head of the Academy's close relationship, Grim would not even waste fifty sorcerer essence on him. Paying him fifty sorcerer essence now was to merely thank the head of the academy. You. Ah. Grim, you're dead. Finally understanding what the situation was, Gabriel was so furious that the elemental vapor surged under his sorcerer robe and tore it to shreds. Then, like a bolt of lightning, Gabriel darted towards Grim as metal scales formed on his knuckles. The force of his flight was so strong that the air current in the surrounding areas was cracking loudly, like a series of lightning exploded around him. This power, what a monster! Yet, Grim had already anticipated this. Wild Instinct Level 1, activate. Boom! Two fists met. In that short moment when the two knuckles, armed with metal scales, clashed, a powerful surge of shockwave burst out to the surroundings. The shockwave was so powerful that the lightning that exploded from this rippled across long distances. Suddenly, Grimm's eyes shrank under the mask of truth. Creak. Grimm's sorcerer robes were in tatters from the shockwave. And slowly, a powerful force was quaking through his knuckle to his arm and then to his back. Then, the force burst out fiercely and pushed Grimm twenty meters away. Letting out a grunt, Grimm quickly retracted his aching arm. Gabriel's fist probably had over 1,500 damage. On the other hand, Gabriel's eyes widened as he saw the metal scales on the back of his knuckle had started to retract as though they were affected by some kind of curse. If it was not for this, Grimm's arm would definitely be crushed. What kind of curse was this? Gabriel quickly analyzed and deduced what was going on. This thing could quickly gather biological information from him and then launch a counterattack in just that short moment. On top of that, it could ignore his double-layer defense sorcery completely too. Gabriel had misunderstood something, obviously. He he, Gabriel. You'll stay where you are. Don't worry. I'll keep you entertained. A fireball darted towards the metal bird and exploded, causing fire elements dusting around in the air. Picking up the scents earlier and continued on his pursuit, Grimm also recalled that weird distorted sorcery earlier. When their fists met, Gabriel was attacking with rage, his fist was carrying a layer of level one wild instinct. Grimm, though, had been utilizing force field to support him while activating wild instinct. This in turn caused a repulsion force to lower some damage, protecting Grimm. And Grimm had found something peculiar from this clash, force fields could weaken wild instinct. It would appear that wild instinct and life code rupture had some form of correlation. This would definitely be useful in Grimm's research on elemental sorcery and refinery sorcery in the future. As he was going through these thoughts, Grimm was also warping onwards using his dimensional distortion. He could feel a tinge of chaotic elemental ripples ahead, 